It's spirulina, I'm not going to keep you guessing. And a brand new meta-analysis has suggested that spirulina improves weight, cholesterol, and blood pressure. But before rushing off to buy spirulina supplements, we need to unpack this a little bit. How strong is the evidence here? Because even though there are statistically significant results, how big is the actual clinical effect? And what dose was studied? So let's start with some context. What actually is spirulina? Well, it's a blue-green algae that grows naturally in lakes, ponds, and rivers in warm, sunny climates. And it's got a long history as use as a food source. And it's proposed to have anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties, which then may result in metabolic benefits. But it became better known after it was used by NASA as a dietary supplement for the astronauts. And there's been a lot of hype about spirulina as a superfood. One kilogram of spirulina has the equivalence of 1,000 kilograms of greens. So that's a claim that's been making the rounds online, and it would mean that a 5-gram serving of spirulina powder would yield a nutritional value of about 5 kilograms of fruits and vegetables. So if that's true, we'd expect some amazing health benefits from spirulina powder. And that brings us onto this most recent meta-analysis. Does the research back up the hype? Well, the authors of this meta-analysis, they were interested in the effects of spirulina on a whole range of metrics related to things like body composition and heart health in overweight and obese individuals. So they made careful searches for existing studies to analyze, and then they pulled the results together. So their analysis ended up including 23 studies with about 1,000 participants altogether. So just to back up a little bit, obesity drives inflammation and oxidative stress. And so those in turn contribute significantly to things like insulin resistance, high blood pressure, and elevated cholesterol levels. So if spirulina can successfully target inflammation and oxidative stress, that's a big deal and would expect that those effects should show up in the kinds of metrics that the researchers were looking at in this new meta-analysis. So let's have a look at the study and see what they discovered. So first, they analyzed the effects of spirulina for people that didn't exercise. So in this group of people, it significantly reduced body weight, total cholesterol, triglycerides, LDL cholesterol, and blood pressure, and it also increased HDL cholesterol. But when spirulina was combined with exercise, they found additional improvements in two areas. So it raised HDL cholesterol a bit higher while lowering LDL cholesterol a bit more. But spirulina, it didn't change fasting blood sugar levels or insulin levels to a statistically significant degree. So there are two important questions to ask at this point. First, how significant were the impacts that they found? And second, how strong is the evidence? So let's start with the impacts. What we want to know is how big a difference the changes that they saw make in the real world. Because even if something has a statistically significant benefit, if the actual clinical effect is small, then there's not much point in taking it. So interpreting this analysis is a bit of a challenge here because they give their results in terms of effect sizes, not absolute values. So in other words, they'll tell us the impact in a certain area, whether it was big or small, rather than quantify the impact. So for instance, they conclude that the impact on weight based on the pooled results is minus 0.3. So according to statistical thresholds, that counts as a small effect. A medium effect would be about 0.5 and a large effect would be 0.8 and above. But what does that actually translate to in terms of actual weight loss? Well, it represents a weight loss of about 2 kilograms or about 2 to 3 percent of the initial body weight of the study participants. So small is the right descriptor here. A weight reduction of about 5 percent is usually considered a clinically meaningful amount. Amount. That's about double the loss seen here. But what about the other positive changes that we had a look at? Well, the cholesterol metrics had an overall moderate effect, which is a positive finding. And then there's blood pressure. Specifically here, we're talking about diastolic blood pressure, which is the bottom number on a blood pressure monitor. So spirulina reduced it on average by about two and a half units. So that's not huge, but it can make a difference. So all of these numbers indicate a potential meaningful, if modest, improvement. Which brings us to the second question. How strong is the evidence? Well, there are some important caveats here, because the researchers note that the studies that they look at had high heterogeneity. So all that means is that the findings of the individual studies, they differed quite a lot between each other. So for this and other reasons, they ranked the quality of evidence for the main findings as low to very low, which means that we don't have a lot of confidence here about the true impact. And an even more recent meta-analysis can give us additional perspectives. So it focused on the same types of metrics, although with a broader population, and it included more studies with a higher total number of participants. So the findings here were similar to the first meta-analysis that we looked at. They also looked, though, at inflammation markers. So here, again, they could see statistically significant reductions with spirulina, but the overall clinical effect was small. And as with the first meta-analysis, the authors of this newer meta-analysis found high heterogeneity between the different studies. So overall, what's the takeaway here? Does it make sense to start using spirulina as a supplement? And if so, what's the right dose? Well, here's my perspective. Overall, 
The study evidence is intriguing, but with a high heterogeneity and generally low quality of evidence, it means that our confidence is pretty low when it comes to knowing the true impact of spirulina. And generally, the clinical impact is relatively small. So instead, I think the right question is to ask about what types of benefits we might expect from spirulina compared to other established benefits from other foods and supplements. So for instance, we've got really strong evidence to back up the benefits of something like the DASH diet when it comes to the metrics that we've been looking at. So for example, a recent meta-analysis found that the diet reduced LDL cholesterol by about 5 units, and that finding was based on 22 studies with about 3,500 participants, and nearly all of the studies were ranked as high-grade. And then there's the research on fiber supplements and LDL cholesterol. So one meta-analysis included 181 randomized controlled trials involving over 14,000 participants. So the LDL cholesterol levels, they dropped by about 8 units on average with fiber supplements. So that's a huge number of studies, many of which were graded as high quality. So when we compare the spirulina research, which is generally marked as low quality, compared to the DASH diet or fiber supplements, for me, I'm much more excited about the DASH diets and fiber supplements compared to spirulina. But personally, I do use spirulina to color my sleep supplement, so maybe there are potential additional benefits by using it as a colorant, but I don't plan on taking separate spirulina supplements at present. But if you've had a look at the research and you've decided that it's worth supplementing, then you might be wondering what spirulina dose to use. Well, the authors of the first meta-analysis that we went through. They recommended a daily dose of about 2 to 3 grams of powdered spirulina for those who are overweight and looking to improve their metabolic metrics. They also mentioned that supplementing for 7 to 8 weeks might be the minimum time needed to actually see some improvements based on the studies that they assessed. But the brand of spirulina is also very important, so I highly recommend that you check out consumerlab.com so they rigorously test supplements to see if the contents actually match the label and avoid heavy metals and other contaminants. So make sure to check out their website and see their take on leading spirulina supplement brands, because just two out of the five brands that they tested passed. And just to be clear, I'm not affiliated with consumerlab.com in any way, I just find their website very useful. Now earlier I mentioned how excess fat can drive inflammation and oxidative stress, which are key contributors to problems like heart disease and diabetes. But what's interesting is that not all types of fat are the same in this respect, so we really need to watch out for visceral fat. So make sure to check out this next video here to see what the latest research says about the best way to eliminate it.